Well, okay, we can start, I guess. Let's do it. Hi, yes, hi everyone. <laughs> I am Anna from Green Geeks, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How to Create Your Brand Content Style Guide with Mary Osman. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words for those of you who are not familiar with Green Geeks. We're a 300% green energy web hosting provider which essentially means we put back three times the amount of power we're consuming to the grid into the form of reno renewable energy. We have been recognized by the US CPA since 2009 and as a green power partner, and we offer share hosting, reseller hosting, VPS, and dedicated server. Now, moving on to the fun stuff, our webinar. <laughs> so a few of skipping items. If you want to ask a question from Mary, you can put it in the Q&A. If you will please put in the Q&A, she will be answering at the end of the presentation. You can chat in the chat room like you've been doing. <laughs> Thank you for letting us know where you're tuning in from. Remember to select everyone if you want everyone to see what you're discussing. And as I mentioned in the, in the chat, we will be recording this presentation. So if you have to step away, don't worry, we'll send you the recording in a couple of days. Also, we have enabled live transcriptions for this webinar, so you have the ability to turn them on during the webinar by going to live transcript and then show subtitles. So I'm going to introduce Erica from our team from Green Geeks, who will be assisting us with the chat and the Q&A. Hey, welcome, Erica. Do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. My name is Erika Barbosa. I am from Costa Rica. I am a computer engineer and I work in the partners team at Green Geeks. And today I'm going to be in the chat, sharing some links and reading your comments. And hope, hope you enjoy today with Maddie. <laughs> Thank you, Maddie. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Erika. And now I'm going to say a few words about Maddie. <laughs> Mary, Mary is a digital native with a decade long de de devotion to creating engaging, accessible, and relevant content. After teaching herself web design at age 11, she found her true passion in content creation, learning the intricacies while transitioning from technical to creative SEO marketer. Mm -hmm. Mary's journey from freelance writer to founder and CEO of the Blogsmith yielded numerous insights to share about content creation for enterprise B2B technology brands. Mary has spoken for many, many audiences, and for us too. She spoke at WorkCamp US, SearchCon, and Denver Startup Week, and you're in Colorado, right, Mary? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome. Would you like to say a few words and start the presentation? Absolutely. Let me get my slides up so they're ready to go. Um, yeah, I think, Anna, you pretty much covered it. Um, I guess just a couple more housekeeping items today. It's going to be a little bit of a workshop. You're going to have a little bit of time to work on this, but I wouldn't get caught up in um, trying to leave today with a finished product because I think style guides in general are always a work in progress. You may be coming to this and have one of your own or maybe you haven't started one at all. Either one of those situations, I think you'll be able to take away something from today. And um, I think as far as Q&A, what I, what I think will work the best, because I think we are gonna take up the whole hour with presentation and workshops is when I give workshop time, I'll go through Q&A and that's your opportunity too, to, to ask questions during that time. And I think what I'll do is I'll respond in the chat so that anybody who's working on the workshop items doesn't get distracted by me reading out the questions and answers. So um, basically the first part of this presentation, it'll be 20 to 30 minutes of just like going through things and then we'll have some workshop time and other sort of slides and presentation stuff in between a few workshop times. So um, if you're tuning in from a computer, I think that's the best tool for today. You'll be able to kind of look through the different resources I'm going to share, um, you know, start your own document of notes and things like that. Notebook is fine too. And, um, you know, grab your favorite beverage if that also helps you to get through the work sessions. So without further ado, we'll kind of kick this off. And um, I won't add too much to my bio. I run a company called The Blogsmith. We do writing and strategy, mainly for B2B technology brands. And then I have a book called Writing for Humans and Robots, and I have a stack of books um, right behind me because I'm going to be referencing 
a bunch of them uh, during our presentation today, but, and it may or may not let me show you this because of the filters I have on, but here's the book. Um, and it's basically related to the topic that we're talking about today, brand style, writing for the web. I'll talk about it a little bit more at the end if we have time. The goal for today is, we've already kind of discussed it, but just to get started and just to make progress. It's not about trying to, um, we're not really starting with the end in mind, to quote another book that I love, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. We just want to get started. We're not we're not aiming for perfection today. And really, um, done is better than perfect, I think, when it comes to writing for the web in general. So what is a brand style guide? Um, here's my definition. Brand style guide is a reference your writers and editors and clients, in some cases, can use to understand how and why you do things a certain way on behalf of the brand. Um, when we talk about style guides, there are also the two sort of different ways to think about it in terms of like the visual style guide, the imagery and things like that, and also the writing style guide. This presentation, this workshop is mostly going to focus on the written style guide, but I do have some things in here for those who are hoping to talk about visual style guides too. And we're going to sort of tie it all together and it's kind of funny um, when I've done this workshop in the past, I've had a lot of attendees who wanted to, to dive into the visual style guide thing, but they told me that maybe it wasn't exactly the topic that they thought it was going to be, but they're glad that they went through the writing stuff because it was something that they hadn't really thought about before. So we will cover both. I want to just share a little bit about like why I'm even qualified to talk about this topic, sort of my journey with writing and style and um really trying to codify my writing voice in a way that other people could um, could really write on my behalf um, to work with editors and things like that. So basically, I started as a freelance writer. And after a couple of years freelance writing, I just started to approach the limit of what I could do on my own. I think like um, one of the best metaphors I can think of or similes or whatever you'd call it is like a masseuse, you know, who is using their hands all the time. I think writing with your brain you just get to a point where you kind of start to hit a wall if you're if you're doing it as much as i was doing it and so i was trying to think about well what should i do next if i'm kind of burning out on the writing but i really still love creating content and running a business and marketing in general um that's when i started to think about maybe an agency model would make more sense and so the next question was, well, how do I sort of replace myself as a bottleneck, as as the writer, and then as the editor, and then, you know, all the other roles that I incorporated later on. And it really came down to this idea of having a clear style guide. And so I hired a couple writers, I was their editor, and then I hired an editor. And together, we put together the very, like, basic foundation of what the Blacksmith style guide was by basically having her do like a first round of edits for the writers and then me going in and saying you know here's some other things that i would have edited for and then her basically writing down those rules so that we had that as a reference for pieces moving forward so once i had the style guide established it was easy for me or it was easier for me to then hire more writers more editors and then build the rest of the business out so let's talk a little bit about besides what you may have heard and what i just said why is it important to think about this topic why should you put your energy into perhaps creating a style guide for your brand um i think the biggest thing is just to get everybody on the same page and and it's an efficiency thing not um wasting time on edits that you've made a million times and you know you know in your head kind of what the rule is but you know, you haven't yet put the effort forth really to codify the rule. I think it is hard to think in terms of not just making the edit, but making sense of the edit. So that is sort of like a mental block that you might have to get over for yourself. I think it's the same thing with defining processes for a business in general. It's a lot easier to just do the thing than it is to like think about how you do the thing. Um, but I think a style guide, once once you get in the habit of making those rules and codifying them, it becomes easier. It's like a muscle that just needs to be, you know, like exercise. 
I think another important thing, especially if you're like a writer who's working with clients, is just that it demonstrates professionalism and it shows your expertise around content publishing. And I'm going to give you an example of this idea of consistency in just a second. Um, and I think, too, from a brand perspective, you know, a brand that has like a media kit, like a public facing version of their visual styles or the written styles and things like that, I think that also shows the people that are interacting with that brand that the brand cares you know enough to put that together and it's a sign of their professionalism as well and then in some ways i think a style guide can also help you to effectively reach your target audience later in the workshop we're going to talk a little bit about brand tone of voice and how it's different for every single brand even though it starts from a lot of the same inputs um but it's it's really about nuance i think style is about nuance and we're going to be digging into that today so let me give you an example of how inconsistency makes you look unprofessional so here are two examples of two titles and one of the things that i would suggest everybody define in their style guide for their sanity is to define if things like the title of your article and even like the subheadings within it of any piece of content for your brand do you use sentence case or title case and so sentence case is like the first letter is capitalized and then any proper nouns are capitalized but every other letter within the words in a sentence are lowercase and title case is more or less every letter and every word or, or sorry the first letter of every word is capitalized so for example this this example on the left is a consistent use of title case. You can see that, you know, both titles, if they were two separate articles, they kind of live in the same world. They're both title case. But then this example right next to it on the right has inconsistent casing. And it's one of those things that seems like a very small detail. And, and maybe it is, but I think the problem with inconsistency is that you look at this and you may not, you may not consciously be thinking, oh, the difference is, you know, these two things on the right um, have different casing or whatever. I think it's, I think you don't even think about that, but your brain comes across this, notices an inconsistency, even if it can't name it. And then I think inconsistency breeds mistrust. And trust is really so important when it comes to building a brand and marketing. If you don't have trust, then people aren't going to buy from you. So that's just one example. And I think that having a style guide saves you from like going back into an old blog post and having to figure out what you did last time. Um, that just wastes time, I think. And it's a lot easier to have your rules in a style guide. So we talked about how style can be two sort of different things, at least in terms of what we're talking about today. We have the written style, which is things like tone, formatting, punctuation, spelling, um, the the perspective, like is it me or you or they or you know something like that. And then the visual styles are more about like the colors and the fonts you use, you know, the right use case of your logo, say for example, is like a watermark on an image you use. And then also if you have preferred formats like PNG or WebP or anything like that, as well as dimensions for, say, for example, your featured image and having all those things documented so that you don't waste time also on edits with a designer. Here's an example of I just recently hired some internal designers for the blogsmith and they wanted to put together like a brand book because um, it really wasn't something that we had done. We had all this information and it was all over the place. And so this is just one example of like what a visual style guide could look like. You could see like different logo variations, some examples of typography, what we use for heading versus body copy. And then also like our colors, we have a main color, we have an accent color. And then I think we're also gonna add a third color, like a highlight, which would be like a yellow or something like that. Um, so that's one way that you could package um, visual styles. Another thing you could do is, again, if you're kind of like somebody who's working with clients and what we're talking about today, it, it's not just for a freelance writer working with clients. I think I say it later on, but we're talking about even just like you have a content team and you all want to be on the same page or you're an individual and you want to be consistent between your own work. But let's say that you're working with clients and um, you have some sort of intake process. This is part of ours. This is one part of where we talk about branding and visual styles. And so we just ask point blank, like, are these, are any of these images that you want us to create or find or 
work with you to source things like that for some brands for example gifts might be inconsistent with their brand tone of voice you know if, if it's like a really formal professional brand gifts may or may not make sense it depends on the gif is it you know a funny gif or is it like um you know showing how to use the product or something like that so just all different ways that you can think about visual styles um one being to just prompt your people that you're writing for the brand that you're writing for and so this is kind of what I was just saying just that when you create a style guide it doesn't just have to be you as a freelance writer working with a brand it could be you working with yourself the idea again is create consistency and an improvement efficiency I think so that you're not going back into old articles how did I do these titles how did I spell e-commerce you know a lot of people have a take on that AP style it's e dash commerce all lowercase but we have a client where it's e capital c commerce and we have to be consistent for that client within the pieces that we're writing for them so again it's one of those very little things right but if you have 500 pieces of content and e-commerce is spelled differently on all of them that's a headache <laughs> so um we also are talking a little bit because my agency specifically focuses on seo and um showing up in relevant search for the brands that we write about to some extent we're we're writing about or we're writing for humans as well as robots and in doing that um we want to understand the difference between these entities humans are basically the ultimate buyer of whatever you're selling they respond to empathy they can be moved they have money um a robot could probably be trained to care about conversions but at this point it's something like buying something or being moved by emotion is really not something they're capable of and so instead you should think about robots really as the medium connecting users with your content and um and sort of optimizing for them you want to be thinking about descriptiveness and also matching for intent which just means whatever somebody um whatever thought somebody has making a search that you're creating content that you want to show up in that search it's understanding why did they put that specific query in the search and are you really the best brand to weigh in on an answer or solution for them that may also pull them down the funnel to buying from you eventually um a lot of people I think it's it's definitely interesting um even in the past month to see um considering robots from like the AI side of things and chat GPT um and some other things like Dale, I think that's how you say it, Dali, but the image generation tool. Um, a lot of interesting things have been happening with robots generating content, but I really am not terribly concerned with them taking our jobs at this point as copywriters, as content creators, mostly because they don't understand nuance. Um, and we do, and that's and that's what we add on top of, say, for example, like a, a generated first draft, like. You still have to go in and 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 make it human readable, even if it looks good at first glance. I'm sure if you pour it into it, you would see that there are several issues with it. And that's all I'll say for now. Um, before we get into the workshop, just a couple more things. One is that you can think about style as like a medium specific thing. You can think about it generally. So the blacksmith style guide, which I'm going to share with you shortly here is really not medium specific there are certain sections that relate to certain types of content we're creating but overall it's the overarching rules for everything we create i do have a separate social media style guide because there are differences between i think long form content and really short form content on specific platforms that have specific rules and so like one thing you want to think about if you're creating a style guide for social, for example, are things like, is there a character count limit? What are best practices with emojis, hashtags? Um, what do you want to make sure your designers know about, um, you know, image files, their dimensions and things like that? So you may create a separate style guide for each of these things. I think if you're just starting, I wouldn't focus on that because that's going to be really overwhelming. Um, but I think social media is one of the things that makes sense to think about separately just because there are different rules for different platforms if you want to be effective. 
Um, so this is the blacksmith style guide. So Erica, if you could share this in the chat, it's it's like blacksmith that tips without any consonants or sorry, vowels forward slash style dash guide. We are working on an online sort of chapter book version of the style guide. So I'm really excited to share that um, in the next probably month or two. But for now, we just have a big old Google Doc. It's about 36 pages long. So again, when you look at it, I want you to think of it as inspo. I don't want you to think of it as like, wow, I have to do this immediately right now. This style guide, just so you all know, um, took years to develop and many different parties of my team contributing. So everybody has to start somewhere. I started from nothing. Now it's here. Um, you could do the same thing. Trust me. Don't get overwhelmed. And then another resource um, that's on a similar note. So the blogsmith style guide, I would say, is probably is a rough estimate. Seventy percent like new content or just like ideas that we've pulled together as we do edits. And then I would say it's probably about thirty percent rehashing AP style. And so you'll see, like, if you control F in the document. Um, the blogsmith style guide you can see for example we'll we'll restate an ap style rule and be like you know we spell e-commerce this way per ap style guidelines so i think it's a good idea i don't think that i'm not sure if there's um a totally free version of the ap style book um what we do at my team is we have an online subscription to it just for easy reference it's again just like how do, how do you how do you spell e-commerce um how do you spell you know certain words that are coming up in pop culture what's the best practice for that it's things like that um but you could also get a physical copy of it and i really like this one so this let's see if it'll let me do it um you can kind of see it but it's a, like a spiral bound version of the ap style book so that i can have a desk copy that i can just like flip through and find whatever it is that I need to figure out at the time. So, um, so yeah, I would highly recommend a subscription to that if building a style guide, building a really um, comprehensive style guide is important to you. And if you do a lot of writing for the web. Um, just a couple tips, and I think we're getting close to the first workshop time. Um, one of my, one of the most important parts of our style guide is around word choice and thoughtful language. Um, I think when you're writing for the web, regardless of who your target audience is, because you are writing for the web, it's going to reach a wider audience. And I think that you want to be really thoughtful about respecting that wider audience by not unintentionally alienating them with bad language. Let me give you a couple examples. So this idea of like being concise and cutting fluff, a great example of that is instead of using words like simply or just, so like simply open the app, just say open the app, cut the simply, cut the just, it doesn't add anything. Um, strong verbs are better. They're more communicative than adjectives. And so I'm trying to remember what my example for this was. Um, give me just a second here. For this one, um, something like we're thrilled is going to get to the point a lot faster and, and more effectively than we're very excited. Those two things almost mean, they kind of mean the same thing, but they kind of mean a different thing too. And then finally, using inclusive language. So for example, um, I suggest using people first language that doesn't put weight on descriptors over characteristics. So like, let's say that we're talking about a person who doesn't have sight. So instead of saying a blind person, you would say like a person who is blind. You lead with the person, not whatever they're dealing with. So um, I'm going to skip this because we're going to go into an exercise, but I'm going to invite you now to ask your questions in the chat, but take five minutes to just kind of think about what we've already talked about. Maybe it's looking through the blogsmith style guide and just picking one section to take inspiration from. Please use it however you want. If you wanna copy stuff verbatim, that is totally fine by me. Or maybe there's something else you heard about word choice or a resource that you wanna look into. So take five minutes and take some notes, work on your style guide a bit. And I'm going to start answering some questions in the chat and I'm going to set a timer to keep us on track here, but I'm going to mute myself while we go through this. All right, so we are getting to the end of the five minutes here. Um, 
So a couple things. Um, first of all, if you have any you know interesting notes that you want to share in the chat, go ahead and do that. I'm going to keep going here. Um, or like, yeah, anything that you're adding to your style guide, anything that you took away from the blacksmith style guide, there might be somebody else who could benefit from that. Um, and then I'm just kind of going off a question that was in the chat. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say earlier is, you know, first of all, a style guide is is kind of almost more for editors than it is for writers. Writers should have familiarity with it, but an editor is the one who really defends style. And I think the great thing about having a style guide and going through the editing process is just by having established rules, it makes edits a lot less personal. So it's not so much like, wow, you're a bad writer, like you messed this up. It's, um, you know, please change this in accordance with this section of the style guide. It's just a lot less personal to do edits that way. All right, so I will continue on here talking about another one of my favorite books, which I'll grab from my stack. Um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. It is like top three book of my life that I love. So Dale Carnegie says, a person's name is to that person the sweetest, most important sound in any language. And I want to kind of make this really personal for everybody by sharing an example that I'm probably not alone in. So my my email is maddie at the blogsmith.com. It is spelled with my preferred spelling. It's pretty clear. There's no modifiers um, in terms of like my last name or, uh, you know, just like initials or something like that. And for some reason, people always get this wrong. Even if I have a signature that, again, reinforces that my name is spelled Maddie. Think about when somebody does that to you, you know, you give them the information. It's a different thing if like they just don't know or, you know, maybe you've only said your name verbally and they're responding and they kind of messed it up like that's a different thing than what I'm talking about I'm saying you give them all the tools and they still <laughs> they still misspell it um it is very important to get names right and I'll give you a couple more examples that are that I see that are frequently misspelled they're probably misspelled more than they are spelled correctly so these are brands that we've written either for or about and so these are things that we've actually put into grammarly it has the style guide feature that i'll show you in a minute that that can help you to catch misspellings but um it's things like like wordpress i think a lot of people on this webinar probably use it because you're you know working with green geeks um where wordpress is so frequently misspelled with a lowercase p and those in the community get really mad about this <laughs> to the point where they actually created a php function called capital p dang it that you can install on a wordpress site to automatically correct for miscasing misspellings um hubspot is another big one i see people spell it with a lower lowercase s all the time which is it, it's kind of it's like funny and it's sad they're one of like the biggest inbound marketing brands they're very well known probably almost everybody on this webinar knows who they are but that is one of the most commonly misspelled brand names and then what's really interesting about this last example mailchimp is that it's not informed by this sort of like two words pushed together and then the the first letter of the second word being capital it's actually the opposite with mailchimp and so just because you think you know the right way to do something don't make assumptions check i always go to like a company's social media pages if i'm not sure because they usually have the correct casing there or their footer on their website so those are really good places to look but then when you have that um, this is a screenshot from Grammarly's style guide tool that I was just mentioning. And so what we go in is we just we just like say what the right way to do it is in Grammarly because every editor and writer on our team has access to the same like business plan style guide that we all share. And so you could put in the rule, you can put in the suggested edit, and then you can share like an explanation of that. And as you can see here, you can also see how often like it comes up and how often people are correcting for it. So that's really interesting and it's a useful tool. I want to add a disclaimer at this point because I've given this workshop before and I had somebody who was dyslexic who said, you know, spelling everything correctly all the time is an impossible standard. And I 100% agree with that. What I'm suggesting here today 
is not perfection. Um, I, I think I led with that. Like the idea of perfection is something to just throw out the door because it's not going to happen. The good news about writing for the web is that it's a very forgiving medium. It's a lot different than print journalism where you then have to print, you know, in the next edition, if you've made a mistake, like what that mistake was, you kind of have to like call it out and own it. On the web, you have this thing where you can just, you know, publish an update. And if it makes sense to to add a correction, you can do that, or it can kind of just like go off into the void and almost like it never happened. So um, be kind to yourself. It's okay to make mistakes. I make them every single day. What I'm what I'm suggesting here today is is to not avoid mistakes. It's to create systems to catch them, like the Grammarly thing. Okay, so um, with all this in mind, I want to take, maybe we'll do three minutes for this so that we can keep moving forward. And I'm going to look at questions again while we're doing this, but this is just another workshop time. I want you to think about, you know, what are some of the brands that you write for and about, whether it's your brand, maybe you have products or features, what are the correct spellings of each of those things? Think about casing, think about spacing between, um, you know, words within whatever it is you're talking about. Think about punctuation. That might be a factor of your brand name. So um, do that or go back to the blacksmith style guide and kind of look through some other sections. I'm going to give it three minutes and I'm going to be looking in the chat and in the Q&A for any questions. Okay, I think we will continue on. So kind of same thing as last time. Um, and then the other idea that you could that I didn't mention out loud, but it's on the slide here, is another way to figure out your common words that you might want to define is to just kind of like look through recent content pieces, see what stands out. And also um, you could take that content and put it in a word tag cloud to see like what are the majority of the words that you use. So it's just another way if you if it's hard to kind of think about this without an example, just go through what you've already written. That's a perfect starting point. Um, but yeah, same thing as last time. If you have any examples, say for example, of like common misspellings for your industry or your writing vertical, share them in the chat. Um, give us a little bit of a laugh. It's always funny to see how people butcher things. <laughs> so um, this is the last workshop part. So we're going to talk about tone of voice and then we'll um, kind of wrap up what we talked about. And if there's time, then we'll have more questions at the end. So uh, tone of voice, Nielsen Norman Group has, I think, the best model of what this is at a high level. And so for Nielsen Norman Group, it's these four spectrums of funny versus serious, formal versus casual, respectful versus irreverent, and enthusiastic versus matter of fact. And what they did was they took a lot of ideas and sort of condensed them into these. And so what's really cool about these spectrums is that they can help you understand foundationally tone of voice what they kind of lack is nuance and you still have to add that back in and i want to give some examples and kind of explore this concept a little bit more so um one resource that i can share with you for just to show you how we capture brand tone of voice with the blacksmith clients is our intake form you might have to put in like a dummy email address to advance through um, I set it up that way that it was required just so that if clients like did half of it, we would still be able to attribute it back to them and send it to them. Um, but anyway, I think it's like on the second page, we ask a lot of questions about brands and then I can't remember. Okay. So it looks like this. Um, and so basically I think I forgot to mention earlier too, that I have all these slides that you guys will have access to. I'm sure Anna will send them out as well. But um, on my Twitter, at Maddie Osmond, pinned to the top, if you want to grab any of these resources now or after the fact, um, just check them out there and it'll have all the links and things too. But anyway, um, so this is this is just a screenshot from that intake form and it's showing that spectrum. And so for each of those four things, we have the two extremes, in this case, formal versus casual, we have like an in the middle, and then we have something that's kind of like a little, like sort of formal, sort of that extreme, sort of casual, sort of that extreme. And um, you kind of got to go through this exercise of defining, and, and we'll have some time to do that, defining what those things mean for you. So um, we in our intake form, we have some extra questions to kind of suss out the nuance. Like you can see here for this specific spectrum, we also ask, 
do you prefer prefer a more formal or conversational tone? And maybe that seems like a silly question, but you'd be surprised by how it changes where somebody maybe says that they are formal and sort of formal, but they really do want a tone that's sort of like inviting the reader in and, and it's not stuffy. So nuance is important, right? And that's why we also have that. Is there anything else that you want to add, you know, to, to define this, especially if you have certain adjectives, perhaps, that dig into if you are really formal, the type of formal you are? Are you, um, you know, the the UK royalty formal or are you US presidential formal? Like there are shades of gray even within the extreme of formal. So that's that's what I'm trying to say is just to think about it from the aspect of um, of the nuance. So I'll give you some examples. Here are here's how I defined it for the blacksmith um, recently kind of going back in and updating something I had already written down for these things, but just kind of looking at it from a new perspective. And I think this is something that it would be worth looking at maybe on a yearly basis just to see how things have changed or maybe how you've done a better job of, of defining the nuance. So two, two examples, respectful versus irreverent. I think we're in the middle. And so my note is we have fun, but we always respect our clients and our readers. We don't disparage others or anyone for fun. We don't like using words such as clearly or obviously because they may unintentionally alienate a reader hoping to learn from us. We like to teach and we take this position seriously. And then just one more example for us, enthusiastic versus matter of fact, I think we're sort of enthusiastic. So my reasoning is the blacksmith brand is passionate about causes we care about. If you're drawing an exciting conclusion or presenting an awesome solution that can make someone's life easier, you should write enthusiastically about it. Just don't overdo it. Um, per the blacksmith style guide, we don't really like exclamation marks. We don't like them in excess. And um, it's okay to ramble a little bit if additional context, such as your relevant experience, can add value. So um, one more example I can give is another brand I've worked with, Word Fence. And they put this together, which is a little bit different than like the spectrum I've given you, but is it just another cool visual way to consider your style? You could put it on, you know, an X and Y axis and and kind of think about it in terms of that. And so I kind of like um, like the bullet points that they have about their brand, serious yet approachable. It's kind of re reminiscent of the Nielsen Norman spectrum, but just using different terminology and, and stuff that's more um, on brand for them. Dedicated yet relentless, powerful and kind, honest and trustworthy, a friend, a protector. And then they kind of give it like a name, the, the sort of the persona of who they are, which is the guardian. So that's just another different way to think about that. So um, we'll do our last exercise. And I think we'll have some time at the end for any other questions. And then I'll do like a little bit of a wrap up too. So what I want you to do with this time, ideally, if you haven't already, or even if you have, take five minutes to define your brand's tone of voice according to those four dimensions on the spectrum. I'll leave this slide up. and. Um, yeah, I think we'll save any questions then for the very end because I think we'll have a few minutes. So I'll go ahead and start the timer. And then if you already have this kind of figured out or if you don't want to add any additional nuance, then I would say go back to one of the other exercises, work on word choice or work on just like sections that you want to add to your style guides. So we'll go ahead and start the clock for five minutes now. All right we'll keep moving forward so if you um made some progress in defining your brand's tone of voice and you want to share in the chat we'd love to hear it might help somebody else um, who might be stuck on defining their brand tone of voice um so let's kind of wrap up here so if you've been here all of today all of this workshop then i'm hoping that this is what you take away from it First of all, I want you to have some ideas for communicating visual styles. It wasn't the full focus of what we talked about, but we did touch on it. And I think it's just as important as the written styles, because I think that people have, I know that people have all sorts of different learning styles. And an example that I give frequently is something like a comparative statistic. If I read it, it's really hard for me to conceptualize the written word. But if I see a picture that's like a bar chart comparing those two stats, it immediately becomes clear to me. And I think that visuals, thinking about different types of whether it's a GIF, a screenshot, maybe a video, um, an infographic, a statistic, um, a, a quote with you know an expert's headshot, all of those things are really great ways to, to add something to your written content. 
I'm hoping that you're also leaving today with some heading and section ideas for your style guide. You can definitely continue to reference the blogsmith style guide and take um, ideas from that, take inspiration from that, as well as I'm hoping that you'll leave today with, you know, maybe just a couple thoughts of common words that you use in your writing and their proper spellings, especially brands that you write for and about. Um, I'm hoping that you leave today with your tone of voice defined on the Nielsen Norman group spectrum. As with really all of these points, these are starting points. And I think that they're really important starting points, but it's something that you're going to continue to flesh out over time. And especially with the Nielsen Norman group stuff, it's adding nuance, adding adjectives and examples and um, you can also use the blogsmith intake form link that I shared as sort of prompts and questions to think about that. And finally, I hope that you leave today not totally overwhelmed with the concept of creating a style guide as we've walked through a lot of really important pieces of it, a really solid foundation that you can build off of over time. And again, the blogsmith style guide, something that I've been working on for years, is still not done. It's not going to be done until the day I die. So it's like, don't think that just because you have a document and it looks good, the fact of the matter is that things change, style changes. And um, I think that's probably a good lead into, I'll, I'll, go, I'll hop back to this, but I want to talk about my book really quick. And so my book, here's one more book that's not mine, um, The Elements of Style. If you're familiar with Charlotte's Web, E.B. White was one of the writers and William Strunk Jr. was his teacher. And unfortunately, William Strunk, um, he, he died before this book came out, but he's one of the co-authors because E.B. White, e. White expanded on his thoughts. And this book, The Elements of Style, is really an essential guide if you're a writer. Um, it's very short. It's not a big book, but it has a lot of just um, grammar rules that, that, that just make sense. And I was inspired by this book um, to write my book, Writing for Humans and Robots, The New Rules of Content Style, because for how great the elements of style is, it was written in 1918, and it could not have anticipated the global world that we live in now, the internet that we write for. And so my book is basically taking a lot of these style principles, expanding them, um, adding context, adding examples of what to do versus what not to do, and really just adjusting for the fact that books like The Elements of Style couldn't have anticipated the internet. So um, my book is available on Amazon. You can get it in Kindle or print edition. And you can also grab the first chapter for free on the book website, which is writingforhumansandrobots.com. It is my favorite chapter because it's about word choice. So if you want to dig into more of that, I would highly recommend at least reading that chapter because um, it is, to me, the most important part of our style guide. Um, this is just for fun. This is a little quiz to test your content style savviness. It, it's very much a companion to the blogsmith style guide. So if you get a low score, it doesn't mean that you're a bad writer, that you don't know style. It means that you're maybe not as familiar with blacksmith style as I am, but it, it's just like things to think about. So I would encourage you to check that out. Um, if you just, if you're in, if you like quizzes, you know, um, and that's pretty much it. So you can reach me. I'm at Maddie Osman on Twitter. If you learned something interesting today, I'd love if you tweeted it out and tagged me. Um, I'm also maddie at theblogsmith.com. If you have any questions after the fact, I'm always willing to, you know, if somebody has a quick query, I'm always willing to help them. So with all that being said, um, if you have any last minute questions, I think we have about four minutes left. I see one here that I can answer, but just kind of like a last call to action here to get your questions in and I would love to help you. So, um, okay, so Mahi says, is it standard to only have one brand archetype? So that's going back to that word fence example, and I'll just put it on the screen because it wasn't that far behind us. Um, I think it's hard to answer that question because that's just what word fence did. I think it's kind of a personal to you and your brand, how you want to define, even how you go about defining the brand, because as you can see in this like word fence example, they created a brand archetype, but in the blogsmith, we haven't necessarily done that. We have personas and things like that, which are the customers that we go after and, and kind of creating characteristics and descriptions that summarize those on a high level. 
Um, so I think most, most brands probably don't even have one brand archetype, to be fair. My suggestion would be to think about the brand as one overarching archetype. And then over time, you could see if there's other opportunities to define other ones. That's, that's just my um, slightly uneducated answer to that. Um, let's see. <laughs> Isa or Isa says, I need to sound authoritative, but still humble. Any tricks? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think one thing, this goes back to marketing in general, and this might not fully answer your question, but I think it's always effective to talk from somebody else's point of view when you're trying to make a point about yourself. So like, if I'm trying to position the blacksmith as the best content agency in the world it's better if i have a client saying that about me and me quoting the client than me saying that we're the best right so i think it's like using almost like like the expertise of others or using sources i was just writing an article the other day and um i wanted to say something about it was about like ai robots and i wanted to say something about um just like how they're they're confident but like they don't they're not they don't like speak truth they confidently speak untruths and so in order to make that point i found an article and i basically just quoted that and it, it was from a um, publication that people trust so i don't know if that answers the question but that's kind of what i'm thinking um maybe one more question from Taylor, what if there are conflicting brand voices that you want to have? Um, I think that the way that I think about this is going back to the idea of different content mediums. So like the social media versus like your long form content or your email nurture sequence, those may be distinct brand voices. I think our social media is a slightly more distinct, it's, it's a different brand voice than our long form content, how we talk about ourselves on our website. So I think that's fine. I think think about it medium specific to start. And then if you still experience conflicts within the same type of medium, then maybe you want to define um, like if we're talking about long form content, maybe your listicles get a different brand voice than your how to articles. So try to try to create consistency however you can, but it is OK if there's conflict because there are different audiences that you're serving on those different mediums. All right, well, that's probably a good place to end at that right on time. Nice. <laughs> All right, thank you. Absolutely. So Maddie, for every for everybody, so the best way to reach if they have any question is your Twitter at yes. Mary Osman. Yep. Is that what it is? Just that's double that's what I would suggest. Yep. <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank you. It was really good. I love branding. So I really enjoyed your presentation. Good. I'm glad. And um, uh, we, um, I just wanted to say real quick. Uh, we don't have the page up, but our next webinar is going to be on SEO trends and how to take advantage of them in for 2023. It's going to be in January. Um, we would send an email to everyone with the link, but uh, you can go also to greengeeks.com slash webinars to find out about new webinars. Um, that's pretty much it, I think. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining me today. Thanks to Green Geeks for hosting. And um, yeah, it's a topic I love to chat about. So definitely open to any questions you have after the fact. Yes, thank you. And um, we will see you soon, Maddie. Thank you so much. And thank you, Erica, for your help. Thank Happy you. Holiday. Thank you, Maddie. Thank Thank you. Happy holidays, you everyone. <laughs> we will see you all yeah. soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.